Well, uh, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, a couple of days ago, Roman Friedman talked about the need to open macroeconomic and finance theory to non-routine change. Uh, today, I want to show you how imperfect knowledge economics enables us to do that in the context of modeling asset price swings and risk. So let, me, uh, let me stand this way so that uh, I can see the screen here. Uh, since the uh, financial crisis of 2007, there's been renewed attention on the tendency of asset prices to undergo wide swings around estimates of benchmark levels. Figure one just, this is just one example. Uh, it uh, plots Schiller's P.E. ratio back to 1901, along with a 50-year uh, historical moving average, which is just a, a crude measure of a historical benchmark. And as you can see from the graph, uh, uh, asset prices have a tendency to undergo swings away from and, and back towards benchmark levels. Some, uh, the swings away can sometimes last for years at a time, uh, but eventually the market self-corrects. Uh, the swings away are bounded. Uh, a sustained counter movement sets in. Uh, if the asset price gets back to the benchmark, uh, oftentimes it, it uh, shoots through that benchmark and continues trending from the other side. Uh, and a key question in financial economics is, uh, well, how do we understand such uh, long swings uh, behavior? The answer we get from uh, contemporary macroeconomic and finance theory uh, comes from uh, constructing uh, uh, overarching models, which use mechanical rules that fully pre-specify, in terms of some causal factors, how individuals alter the way that they make decisions and how market outcomes unfold over time. There, there's much empirical research that shows that these models are grossly inconsistent uh, uh, with the basic features of asset price swings, especially those based on the rational expectations hypothesis. In our research, we argue that this empirical failure can be traced to fully pre-specifying change. That is, not recognizing that there are limits to what we can know about the causal process and how it fold, unfolds over time. The problem of having limits to what we can know is particularly important in financial markets where outcomes are driven primarily by how market participants alter their forecasts of prices and risk. Uh, uh, how they alter their forecasts stems in part on how they revise their thinking about the future, namely how they revise their forecasting strategies. And RAH models presume that market participants never revise their forecasting strategies. But recognizing that participants do revise their forecasting strategies, at least intermittently, is essential to understanding fluctuations in asset markets. And the key problem that we face is that participants themselves, let alone an economist, cannot fully foresee when and how they might revise their forecasting strategies. Behavioral finance, for its part, jettisons the a priori assumptions of the rational, so-called rational market model. Uh, the, the, these assumptions use empirical findings. Uh, I'm sorry, these assumptions yeah, use empirical findings to justify uh, their assumptions about uh, individual decision making. Uh, these assumptions emphasize the importance of psychological considerations, such as emotions and confidence. And this empirically based approach is uh, an advance over REH's uh, reliance on a priori, supposedly universal constraints on how individuals should behave. But behavioral finance formalizes its empirical findings with mechanical rules that fully pre-specify all change in their models. And because these models are fully predetermined, the models imply systematic forecasting errors. And as Robert Lucas has forcefully argued, if your theory reveals profit opportunities, you have the wrong theory. Now while we agree with Lucas on that, we disagree with Lucas that REH is the solution. Uh, as Roman discussed a couple of days ago, imposing REH in your model does not rid the model of irrationality, in part because it disregards non-routine change. Non-routine change poses a, a daunting challenge for formal economic theory. And assuming it away, as contemporary theory does, does not eliminate its importance. 
So how can we recognize the importance of non-routine change and yet develop models that can be confronted with time series evidence? How can we account for the central importance of fundamental factors in driving outcomes, which REH models stress, but also accord a role to psychological considerations that behavioral economics emphasize, without presuming that market participants forego obvious profit opportunities? ITE provides a way by recognizing uh, that change can, cannot be fully pre-specified. The conditions that we impose on individual decision-making in IKE model formalize empirical findings from behavioral economics and insights from other social sciences. For example, that social conventions matter for the way individuals make decisions. But unlike behavioral finance, IKE's conditions recognize that the regularities that individuals exhibit are at best qualitative and contingent. In many respects, the micro foundations of an IKE model are like other macroeconomics and finance models. They consist of representations of individuals' preferences, constraints, forecasting behavior, and decision rule. So how do we model uh, preferences and decision rule? Well, we rely on Kahneman Sversky's prospect theory. Uh, there's much experimental evidence showing that expected utility theory is grossly inconsistent with how individuals actually make decisions. But we extend the original formulation of prospect theory to recognize the importance of imperfect knowledge, and, and we call this extension endogenous prospect theory. Beyond recognizing imperfect knowledge, endogenous prospect theory solves other problems in applying prospect theory to modeling asset markets. For example, modeling limits to speculation. Endogenous prospect theory and imperfect knowledge economics and portfolio balance lead to a new model of participants' risk premium. I, I don't have time to uh, go through the details, it's in the paper, but because individuals are endogenously loss averse, they demand a premium to hold open positions in the market that depend on the gap between the asset price and participants' assessments of its benchmark value, an idea that goes all the way back to Keynes, rather than on the typical volatility measures uh, that you get from REH models. The micro foundations of our model, which are again in you know, the derivations in the paper, lead to a momentary equilibrium condition that's given in equation 23, where P denotes the asset price, uh, P hat is, uh, re represents an aggregate of market participants' forecasts, uh, uh, one, one period ahead, it, it, it's an aggregate of bulls and bears uh, and the diversity of their, their views. Uh, P hat uh, benchmark, uh, BM, is uh, an aggregate of, uh, or represents an aggregate of participants' uh, uh, estimates of the benchmark value. Uh, equation 23 is like other accounts of asset price swings. It, uh, it implies that the main driver of asset prices is in fact the market's expectation. So you can see in equation 23 that if there's a persistent movement of P hat away from estimates of the benchmark value, there's a, going to be a corresponding swing in the asset price. If we were to fully pre-specify change, fully pre-specify how P hat unfolds over time, and impose REH, then the asset price would be equal to the REH fundamental value. Our ITE representation, uh, while it recognizes that participants might look at estimates of benchmark values and forecasting the future. It also recognizes that there are many other fundamental factors that participants would look at in thinking about the future and forecasting the future. So how do we model expectations? A good place to start is Keynes's account in the general theory. Keynes understood that because our knowledge is uncertain, both fundamentals and psychological considerations matter for decision making. As he put it, we are merely reminding ourselves that human decisions affecting the future, whether personal or political or economic, cannot depend on strict mathematical expectation, since the basis for making such calculations does not exist, and that our rational selves are choosing between alternatives as best we are able, calculating where we can, but often falling back for our motive on whim or sentiment or chance. What's great about this quote is that it makes clear that rational individuals in real world markets use knowledge of the facts. 
but because our knowledge of how to interpret those facts is an inherently imperfect, calculation alone is not enough. We have to fall back on emotions, uh, uh, confidence, uh, and other psychological considerations. Uh, of course, Keynes' assertion that uh, both fundamentals and psychology are important uh, doesn't make it so. Uh, but there's a lot of evidence uh, that shows that fundamentals and psychology uh, uh, matter for decision making in asset markets. Uh, we talk about some of that evidence uh, in our paper. Uh, some of that evidence comes from uh, research that a student of ours, Nick Manji, has uh, done where he read the daily market rap stories from Bloomberg News uh, to see which factors those uh, news accounts uh, indicated were the main drivers of asset prices each day. And the wonderful thing about the data is that they're not constrained to only picking up fundamental factors. Actually, the journalists are often talking about psychological considerations like confidence, optimism, fear. Uh, and one of the main conclusions from that research is that while psychological considerations are there and they're important, fundamentals play the central role. Moreover, the way fundamentals matter changes over time in ways that we can't fully foresee. Uh, for those of you who perhaps doubt that fundamentals are driving swings in asset markets, perhaps figure five might, uh, 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 might lower some of your doubts. Uh, it, it plots the S&P 500 uh, price index between 92 and 2008, along with current earnings. And while the swings in that figure are not perfectly parallel, uh, they're, they're unbelievably close, and, and, and the, 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 the reversals in, 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 in the swings uh, line up incredibly well. So how do we represent the importance of fundamentals and psychology? Uh, for how market participants forecast and, and how we recognize that the way those factors matter uh, is, is non-routine. Well, the way we do it is we suppose that market participants uh, forecast, we, we relate that to a, a wide range of fundamental factors, which is represented by the vector Z, and beta represents a vector of aggregate weights that participants attach to those fundamentals. The representation in 24 implies that there are two main factors driving the market's forecast uh, over time. Uh, movements in fundamentals, which in some cases are influenced by economic policy, uh, and revisions in market participants' forecasting strategies, which in our model could involve different fundamentals mattering during different time periods. The problem we face and the daunting challenge is that we don't know exactly how the market participants think at any point in time. The good news is that we don't need to know exactly how market, particip market participants think to get the dynamics. What we need is some regularity in how market participants revise their forecasting strategies and some regularity in how uh, fundamentals uh, move over time. Now, in order to focus on the implications of revisions of forecasting strategies. In this paper, we assume that the uh, fundamental variables follow a stochastic process. And we assume a, a random walk with, with a constant drift. A more complete IQ model would allow for non-routine change in policy making and other aspects of the social context, but we, we, we ignore that in this paper. In modeling revisions, we look for empirically relevant regularities on the individual level and ask whether they can count for the regularities on the aggregate level, namely asset price swings. And again, Keynes's account is instructive. Keynes argued that in using their knowledge of the facts to form forecasts, participants fall back on what is in truth a convention, which lies in assuming that the existing state of affairs will continue indefinitely except insofar as we have specific reasons to expect a change. Even if market participants have reasons to expect a change, it's entirely unclear which forecasting strategy, if any, they should adopt. Given this uncertainty, there's a tendency for market participants to revise their strategies in what we call guardedly moderate ways. That is, there's a tendency for participants to either keep with their current strategy 
or revise their strategies gradually. Wow, five minutes. Uh, uh, guardedly moderate revisions do not generally alter the set of fundamentals or how participants interpret these fundamentals in thinking about the future. So how do we formalize uh, guardedly moderate uh, revisions? So we, we, we don't use mechanical rules. Uh, uh, we use qualitative uh, conditions uh, which are given in equations 28 and 29. Uh, to see the implications of these qualitative conditions, uh, uh, the, uh, think, uh, consider again the, uh, the change in uh, the market participants' forecast from one point in time to the next. Uh, if revisions are moderate enough, the impact of those revisions on p hat will be smaller in size than the impact from trends in fundamentals. So movements in fundamentals are going to dominate movements in the market's forecast. So if there's a stretch of time uh, during which individuals either stick with their current strategies or they gradually change them, the trends in fundamentals are going to push p hat in a particular direction, in one direction or another. And if p hat moves in one direction, we're going to get a swing in the asset price. In deciding when and how to make, uh, 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 to revise uh, uh, forecasting strategies, a market participant is going to look at many factors, including news about fundamentals, the performance of a current strategy, but also confidence, intuition about change. But because the conditions we impose on change are qualitative, they allow for myriad possible changes in beta, and therefore myriad non-routine ways that fundamentals and psychology matter for forecasting behavior. These qualitative conditions are also contingent. So while there's a tendency for participants to revise their strategies gradually, they don't always do that. Sometimes there's reasons to revise their strategies in a dramatic way. And we show in the paper that such revisions can be associated with reversals in the swing in p hat and therefore reversals in the swing in the asset price. And because of this contingency, because individuals uh, sometimes uh, revise their strategies in dramatic ways, the model implies irregular swings of irregular, uh, uh, irregular swings of, uh, uh, well, irregular uh, duration and magnitude. So what do we get from the model? We get predictions that are contingent on how knowledge unfolds. Right? So the model implies that price swings will occur during stretches of time in which trends in the fundamentals are persistent. And participants on the whole revise their strategies in guardedly moderate ways. And because fundamentals often do trend in persistent directions, and participants often but not always revise their strategies in gradual ways, the model implies that irregular swings are an, in, are an inherent feature of asset markets. If a swing is initially toward benchmark values and fundamentals continue to trend and individuals continue to either stick with their strategies or, or revise them gradually, the asset price will shoot through the benchmark value and continue trending from the other side. I didn't have time to talk about it, but our IT model of risk implies that swings away are ultimately bounded. Ultimately, when the gap gets very big from the benchmark, uh, the bulls, risk premiums get very large and it, it's, it's part of the process in which the market self-corrects. Uh, the contingent nature of a representation uh, implies that when a swing away or when a swing uh, back begins and ends, you, you can't predict that exactly. Uh, there's no probability distribution that's going to uh, 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 describe uh, uh, those swings. And as a consequence, uh, our model is compatible uh, with the coexistence of bulls and bears. Uh, I have very little time, so let me just mention, in a recent paper, uh, co-authored with uh, Katerina Giselius and uh, Soren Johansson, we show how to derive implications from this IKE model concerning time series despite the model's contingent predictions about change. And what we show is that if the tendency towards guardedly moderate revisions is pronounced enough, the model can actually account for 
I2 persistence, which is what we observe in currency markets and other asset markets as well, uh, REH models uh, uh, are, are able to uh, account for at most uh, uh, near I1 behavior in uh, movements away from the benchmark. Uh, I don't have any time to talk about it, but uh, our IT account of, of asset markets implies an intermediate view of markets in the role of the state. And it offers a, a conceptual fame, framework for thinking about uh, the role of the state. Uh, but uh, I guess I'll have to leave that for uh, another day. Thank you.